Okay, so uh, Christina was was going to give the introductory uh, introductory talk, kind of set set ground, I think, for some of the talks later today. So uh, since she canceled, uh, I'm going to take her place and, and do my own uh, version of that. And so what what I'm going to talk about is a is a bit of background on. Uh, what we call active matter problems, a very slight amount, and then talk about particular problems uh, that arise in uh, active matter that is made up of biological components, how we model it, uh, some of the instabilities that we've, we've uncovered for those kinds of systems, and then just kind of, kind of give a general phenomenology walking along. And, and, uh, and then I'll think you'll, you'll see why uh, people are calling things perhaps without completely having done due diligence on, on turbulent scaling and things like that, why, why people talk about things like bacterial turbulence or active turbulence and so on. Mark, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, so let me, let me just, yeah, that's, that's indeed. And it was not my title. <laughs> so it came, yeah, I really don't know where it came from. I, what's that? Yeah, but you, you know. Yeah, you came for vortices. You end up with a bunch of you know stupid microtubules. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, there will be vortices. I promise. No, no. That well. Yeah. Yeah. Since you've started me on this path, so I've always thought that would be a really fun thing to do, is on the last day of the meeting cancel. You know, not have talks. And everybody throws their talk, so to speak, into a bag, and then you grab somebody's talk and you just extemporaneously give it. You know, just <laughs> ad lib all the way through. I thought that would be kind of fun. That's the kind of thing I might like to do. Okay, so, uh, but what I'm going to talk about are active matter systems that are, that are related, for example, to this as one example. These are, these are components inside of the cell. Green are microtubules, which are long stiff biopolymers that do a lot of the force transduction inside of cells. This is the cell nucleus, and what's being uh, fluoresced there are what are called histones, which are big proteins that DNA gets wrapped around. And then the, uh, the red is the membrane of the cells. It's staining actin, not staining. These are, these are actually fluorescent proteins. So it's labeling uh, actin, which has a, uh, an active network that often sits on the boundary of the cell and lends it rigidity and sets up polarity and things like that whatever that means, if you don't know what that means. I'm trying to remove jargon as I, maybe as I go along, but I'll do my best. Okay, so, but here, here is like, we, we all have kind of a standard active matter introductory slide, so, so here is mine. So, uh, so I'm really gonna talk about our collective behaviors in ensembles of active particles. So here are examples, and I've, I've kind of divided it in terms of, of what you would call inertially dominated versus viscously dominated systems. So we could talk about uh, there's a collective behavior, laning by a bunch of bicyclists because they want to reduce their drag by letting the leader take, take all, the, all the problems. Uh, we have schooling of fish. Fish balls, I think, are a really beautiful uh, kind of collective behavior, which is not understood at all, formation of fish balls and the structure of fish schools. And flocking, which can be both behavioral and in response to hydrodynamic interactions of vortices that are being shed into the, into the fluid. These are all very high Reynolds number instances. Those are difficult, much more difficult to handle because you shed vortices off into the fluid and that's, a, that's like a memory of past events that then other elements in the ensemble have to contend with. There's been uh, far more understanding developed in, in kind of the lower part of this slide where we're really talking about things happening at micron scales. And so here is uh, bacteria that are swarming around. I'll talk a bit about that uh, inside, of a, inside of a fluid. And you're actually tracking, vortice, you're tracking individual bacteria, and you can see there's vortices and things like that that show up. Uh, there's self-assembly processes that come from the activity of motor proteins moving around on, on top of these microtubule polymers. Uh, these have been pulled out of the cell, so to speak, and, and this is uh, from one of Zonomir Dojic's uh, experiments put onto surfaces, and then you, you see things that is, is now called defect turbulence uh, by many, which is the kind of very unsteady production and annihilation of, of defects in kind of an active liquid crystal material. 
And uh, there's also problems that have to do with these active components doing very fundamental things in cell biology. This is something I'm particularly interested in, such as positioning genetic material inside of, a, inside of an embryo and orchestrating the, the division of, of genetic material into two cells. These are all really kind of active materials problems. I'm really going to concentrate down here. So uh, here's very, two very influential experiments in this, in this field of kind of what I would call biologically active suspensions. So here I'm really talking about things that sit at Reynolds numbers about 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 4, something like that. Inertia is irrelevant to these. And so what you're seeing here, I think this is, this is about a 300 uh, micron scale on this. And these are very, these are very beautiful and, and kind of now classic experiments from John Kessler and Ray Goldstein. And what, it's, what you're seeing here is the roiling dynamics of tens of thousands of bacteria. You're just seeing the individual bacteria roiling around inside of a pendant drop. And so they're at high concentration. And they did PIV, particle imaging velocimetry, on, on this system. You can see it's very, at least very chaotic. And what you see is it's characterized by having jets and vortices that are constantly kind of decaying away, forming again, interacting with each other. And to kind of the you know, casual fluid mechanician's eyes, you would, you would call that turbulence. Indeed, that's been labeled as, as uh, bacterial turbulence. And you know it's the fluid that's orchestrating a lot of these large-scale structures because the speeds that are associated with this are about an order of magnitude greater than the swimming speeds of any individual bacterium. So these structures have length and time scales, and certainly time scales, that are faster than individual speeds. So they're reaching mixing and locomotion speeds collectively that are much bigger than just that of a single bacterium. Yes. That's right. So, uh, and this is from another experiment of, of Zonomir's. See in the back row here, probably preparing his talk. <laughs> and so what you're seeing here is a suspension of microtubules and motors. And what has happened is that into the system has, has been flowed fuel for this, ATP, so that the motors can actually move on microtubules and couple them together. And what you find is another type of what's now called active turbulence, where the microtubules bundle together, shown here, because there are other types of things going on in the system. But these bundles are kind of extending all the time, causing fluid flows interacting with each other. And you get this very complex kind of dynamics again. Now, if we look at an individual Bacterium, it turns out that the flow fields around them have been measured. It's uh, tough, a very tough uh, problem. And this is out of Ray, Ray Goldstein's uh, group. And so what you're seeing here is the flow field around a single bacterium. And this was a heroic, well, it's averaged over many bacteria, but here's the flow field around a, a bacterium. And what it looks like is because you have a thrust element at the back, can you guys see what's supposed to be the flagella? Here on the bacterium, it's a squiggly little, maybe it's not just not big enough. Oh, there, look at that one. See, there's a flagellum. Oh, I actually have a pointer. So, uh, and what happens is that the flagellum is pumping fluid back. It's moving itself forward through the fluid, so it's dragging <laughs> fluid forward on its cell body. And that creates an extensile flow along, in the lab frame, an extensile flow along the axis of the swimmer. And... In this low Reynolds number world, everybody is a force dipole. You don't exert a mean force on the fluid if you're a freely moving object. You're a force dipole. And so this is, has the structure of what's called an extensile force dipole. So that's the kind of flow you associate with a particular type of, of uh, solution to the Stokes equations. We're talking about the Stokes equations here. So uh, everything I'll be talking about today, I ha hopefully I have them written down. I do have them written down somewhere. But basically, we're just looking at, at minus grad P plus mu Laplacian U being driven by forces, stresses. Okay, So there's no inertia in this. It's just Navier-Stokes without the nonlinear inertial terms. OK, so in this previous example, the, the one with the microtubules and motors, why is this interesting? 
aside from the fact it produces these great movies and you know, ma applied mathematicians and physicists can, can occupy themselves trying to understand them. So as I said, uh, these kind of biopolymers and motors do a lot of very important things inside of cells. And so what you're, what you're seeing here is the male and female pronuclei inside of a single cell uh, worm nematode embryo being moved into the center of the cell, forming a structure that divides the chromosomes, which are those red uh, fluorescing things in there, and then moving into cell division. So these kind of green arrays are stiff biopolymers that are constantly forming and depolymerizing. And each of them lives only for about 30 seconds, 20, 30 seconds. They're very transitory, but they are orchestrating the transduction of forces to move things around that take on the order of 10 minutes or even longer. So these, Mike, and, and so I'm going to be talking a bit about these because I'm, I and my group, people I work with, spend a lot of time thinking about the physics of how you move things around and position them inside of cells because you have motors and microtubules. It's kind of a fluid structure interaction problem is a biophysics problem. So now, not only are they moving that stuff around, you see that kind of football-shaped thing that forms. That's called the mitotic spindle, or a spindle. And it's really a structure, and this is actually one that is formed in a test tube from Dan Needleman's uh, group, one of my collaborators at, at Harvard. And uh, this is a spindle that's been formed inside of a test tube. It's about 50 microns long, 70 microns long, something like that. And it's just a bunch of long polymers that are connected, get, connected together by active motors. And if it were inside the cell, then you would have nuclear material inside of there, and it would be doing some other things. But this is kind of the static structure. So it's like this physical object, which is very interesting to think about how it assembles itself, how it assumes a shape, how it assumes a scale, things like that. OK, so that's why it's important. Now, here's a, a shameless advert. But if you want to, if you want to read uh, some stuff about the fluid mechanics inside of the cell, there's a, a little article that Dan Needleman and I wrote a couple of months ago in Physics Today. You can take a look at that. OK, but let me tell you a bit about uh, microtubules and their motor proteins, OK? Because I'm going to be kind of focusing uh, in a bit on these, on these systems to try to understand them. And so here, I'm just going to use a kind of a representative biophysics slide. So I have a array, an ensemble of microtubules that are then sitting inside of some sort of abstracted spindle. If I look at individual microtubules, they're very, very thin. They're, they're about 25 nanometers in diameter, which means that they are perfect as an applied mathematician when you're looking for kind of reduced models. They're long, skinny things. They're quite rigid. They're also very dynamic, as I said. They live only about 20 seconds, really. And they're also polar, which means they have a plus end and a minus end. And motor proteins have evolved, along with microtubule themselves to know how to walk along them in particular directions. And so uh, what are some of the motor proteins? The, the one that I'll really be talking about today is what's called a kinesin protein. Uh, in this case, kinesin-1 is what is being used in this first, ses first set of experiments of, of uh, zonomere. And you can think of them as kind of little molecular machines that will attach, bind onto a microtubule and they will consume ATP to change their shape and to walk along the microtubule. And they can have binding sites sitting between two microtubules. So if they bind to two microtubules that are oppositely aligned in terms of their polarity, so kinesin likes to walk, kinesin 1, towards the plus end, it will cause them to flux past each other because they'll be trying to walk to opposite ends. There's other uh, motors such as dynein, which is very, very important inside the cell. There's a whole other kind of talk I could give about dynein and what it does. It coats lots of surfaces, but I'm not going to focus on that so much. It's a minus N directed uh, motor protein. OK, but because things are so complicated, this is now kind of my version of things. Because things are so complicated inside of the cell, it's hard to tease apart Who's doing what? It's very difficult to perturb things inside of the cell. You can do knockdown experiments and try to change the way proteins are being expressed and change the way you know, maybe binding happens or something like that. But you could, you could cause lots of other things to change too. So there's been a lot of work in taking actually either the innards of the cell and kind of 
pulling them out and playing with them inside of a test tube, or in actually constructing uh, much more synthetic systems where you just have a few of these, uh, these biophysical elements. And so I showed you uh, these experiments of Zonomir. And these are useful. Let me just say they're very useful to applied mathematicians because if you want to understand something like the spindle, you need to understand how stresses are being produced by the interactions of, of microtubules through motors, and that can all depend on the type of motor. So having experiments that are kind of pulling pieces out in isolation to play with is extremely useful. Okay, so I showed you this one already. So now this particular case, uh, that, this is a very hard problem to model. There's lots of moving parts in this. Microtubules are forming into long bundles. There's so-called polarity sorting by kinesin motors that inside of there, everything's stretching. It's very complex. So uh, this is another uh, system where it's exactly the same material, but instead it's been coated onto the surface between oil and water. So you end up with this very dense uh, kind of active suspension. And this is where you see, for example, these defect dynamics, where you have this kind of constantly roiling state, which is self-powered, internally powered, just from motors moving around on the constituents that sit inside of this now kind of layer of active fluid. So as I said, you know, this, this kind of system is, is a study of a lot of, of people, including, uh, where's Luca today? Luca, we'll be talking about parts of this, I think, later today. And uh, you can play with different types of motors. And so uh, this is a different, si oh, the wrong person played. So uh, instead of getting this kind of extensile dynamics that you get from kinesin, if you look at systems of microtubules that instead have dyning, which I'm not really talking about today, these lead to kind of contractile systems. They so dyning turns out bundles together the minus ends of microtubules and makes kind of a compaction of everything. And this is important actually in, in some of our spindle modeling. You can change the type of kinesin motor. You can change the, uh, I'll talk about this briefly at the end. You can, you can look at dense gels of these microtubules that are connected together by a different type of kinesin motor. And you can probe them directly and try to understand the speeds at which polarity sorting is taking place as flux of microtubules past each other and kind of the global structure of that by uh, bleaching, photo bleaching uh, fluorescence and then watching how these, these bleach lines move apart as microtubules are moving past each other. I'll talk about that briefly at the end. It reveals a lot about the mechanics, we think, of what's going on in the spindle. Okay, but how do you model some of these systems? So there's many ways to do these kinds of things. So there are what are called <laughs> symmetry-based models. Uh, which I, I won't talk about. I'll leave that to others today, where you include allowable terms, allowable active terms, allowable passive terms, and then you try to figure out what their coefficients might be and matching with experiments. Uh, I'm more of a bottom-up kind of person. And so uh, I like to try to derive models by taking a microscopic model for how the microstructure interacts and then figure out how I can coarse grain that up to, up to large scale so I can identify all the coefficients in my large scale model. So to do that, you need some coarse grain variables that kind of arise naturally out of the theory. But so what I really start off with is something more like a Fokker-Planck description. So if I, if I just think about, for example, having a bunch of microtubules, then all the microtubules have a center of mass position and they have an orientation. I'm gonna be looking at a continuum theory, so I'm gonna describe a distribution function that over space and orientation tells me how the suspension is, arra is arranged. So given this distribution function, I can take various moments. If I just average over this sphere of orientations, I'll get the concentration. If I average in the first moment in orientation, so here P is just a direction vector of a single microtubule. If I average over the, the sphere of orientations, I get what's called the polarity. If I take the second moment tensor, PP transpose against the distribution function. That turns out to give something in these systems that's called the active stress. It arises naturally as kind of the stress tensor, central stress tensor element. And then you have other things like if I, if I normalize this so-called D tensor by the uh, concentration, 
then I get a classical, what's called a tensor order parameter for the liquid crystal and director field. So this is kind of, there's some liquid crystal physics for those of you that are kind of tuned in with that. This kind of arises naturally in these systems. So here is, now, now I'm going to give kind of a review going back, you know, 10, 15 years of, of work. I'll try to keep it brief, but I, but I think it's interesting. So this is, this is, I think, with this kind of distribution volker planck type description. This is the most uh, basic, unelaborated micro-macro theory that you can have for these types of systems. It's really a dilute suspension theory that follows off of doyen onsager for rigid rod suspensions. And so we have a fokker planck equation for the dynamics of the distribution function given kind of conformational fluxes, right, for how a single particle moves and rotates itself. So the microscopic problem that you have to solve is how a single particle, say, like this bacterium, and there I'm showing you the flow field that a bacterium has around it, or other types of active particles. For example, you can take gold and platinum rods, tiny little two micron rods, put them in, into, a, into a chemical soup, and they will produce surface flows that look like the surface flows of bacteria, but without motility. They don't move themselves, they just produce flows and get moved around by interactions with others. So this theory describes suspensions of s such objects. And so then what you, what you calculate is the velocity in the, in the direction of the uh, orientation vector. You get moved around in the background velocity that whatever stresses the ensemble produces, produces. You have a center of mass, uh, <laughs> geez, diffusion, let me call it that. That's what that is. And then this is the classic Jeffries equation that just says if I have a rigid object inside of a flow and it's much smaller than the scale of the flow itself, it just gets rotated by that flow. And that comes only, rotation comes only through the gradient. Then the real work, once you've, once you've done this, is to, is to calculate what is the coarse grain stress that acts on a coarse grain Stokes equation and drives the creation of a background flow that then moves everybody. And so this is where you do all your work in the formation of what's called an active stress. You can, you can calculate this using kind of classical uh, methods due to Batchelor and to Kirkwood. And then what you calculate is the active stress, the mean field stress that gets produced by this ensemble, and it turns out it looks like some parameter times this detensor. That's the stress that's going to sit here under a divergence and drive the creation of a mean flow that then is moving your ensemble around. Okay, so this is, off, this is called the active stress in these systems. There can be other terms for other physics that you may be measuring or modeling. But the main thing here is that you have, if this parameter here is negative, that corresponds to flows that look like this, extensile flows. If those flows were reversed and you said you had a, com a compressional straining flow along the axis, this alpha would be positive instead. Okay, so this is a semi-dilute suspension theory where the active particles create fluid stresses that then move the particles. That's kind of the system. Okay, so you can do lots of stability type calculations, which I'm going to kind of suppress in the interest of time, uh, except to say you have some kind of generic results that apply to many of these active rod-like systems, both to microtubule models and to swimmer models. And one of them, and, and this really starts off with, with uh, very similar work by, by Simha and Ramaswamy in 2002, is that in these kind of low Reynolds number worlds of swimmers or, or dipolar particles, these extensile particles, you have no globally pneumatic states. You have no flocks where everybody is going in the same direction. And that's because if you're looking at aligned states, there's an, there is a... Uh, an orientational instability, I'm kind of searching for words this morning somehow, but there is a, an alignment instability that will take you out of being aligned and everybody swimming in the same direction. I'll just demonstrate this right now. And so here is a, is a, a simulation uh, done by Wen Yan in, in my group where there's 100,000 model swimmers in a periodic box. And initially, they're all pointing in the same direction. And we're solving the Stokes equations in the presence of these swimmers interacting with each other hydrodynamically and by collisional forces. Here's what it does.
I'll stop it right there. The first thing it starts to do is it develops a orientational instability where for the direction of the alignment, the mode of maximum growth is a Fourier wave vector in the direction of alignment. So you start seeing this kind of transverse mode that forms. So this is a very kind of now canonical instability that you see in many of these active matter systems. And I'll just let this go. So you can see that what this does then is it go goes into a, into a roiling state, which is very reminiscent of those first movies I showed you from the Kessler-Goldstein paper. So, oh, uh, they're showing different fields, that's all. So this is the velocity field, and this is, I'm not sure what this one is actually, but this one is the velocity field. Yeah. When, where's when? Where is the, my group member who made these movies? <laughs> See here, it, it says omega here, but I don't think that's really the vorticity. I think that's something else. So could we turn down the external noise, please? Okay. Now, there's, a, I think, a beautiful instantiation of this that, that Zonomir sent me a couple years ago, where he takes his active suspension and he shear aligns it so that all these microtubule bundles are pointing in one direction, right? Just like this initial data on the left, and then lets it go. Here it is, rolling around, shear aligned. And then you see this very nice transverse instability come out of that. And then it will move back into this rolling state. So we're starting to understand some kind of canonical instabilities, I think, in, in these systems. You can make this extreme by taking a whole bunch of swimmers confined to a little layer, pointing them all in the same direction. Actually, these aren't swimmers. These are just these unstable di extensile dipole particles and letting them go. And then you can get things like iterated instabilities that actually map onto classical instabilities in porous media, actually Rayleigh-Taylor Rayleigh -Taylor type. So what's that? That's a time lapse movie, yeah. No, this is a 3D movie. This is 3D. This is 2D. Yeah. So, so uh, it, it shows up very weakly, actually. What's more important is the aspect ratio. I'll get to that, and I'll show you here in just a second. Actually, it's not so weak. So it's kind of complicated why I said both things, but I can, t I can tell you why later. <laughs> you can also look at the stability of uniform suspensions, where everybody's kind of pointing without, prob you know, without bias in any direction, right? Just let them go. So then you can linearize these, these Fokker-Planck equations, and you can generate an eigenvalue problem for the growth of plane waves in this. And uh, it turns out that you can reach some nice conclusions from this. One is that if you are extensile, so that alpha was negative, then you have to satisfy that this ratio of things is greater than a critical value. And that ratio is the length of the swimmer over the size of the box that contains them times an effective volume fraction. Of swimmers. So you either have to be long enough or you have to have enough swimmers. And once your concentration is high enough, then the whole thing goes. Okay? So, and. Is that, is that without rotational diffusion? That is without rotational diffusion. It's modified a bit with rotational diffusion. Yeah, I'm making everything kind of sure. the simplest thing. So, uh, yeah. If you had rotational diffusion, uh, stability line would go down here. But uh, one thing that comes out of this, and this is characteristic whether you have rotational translational diffusion or not, is that it kind of generically in these active matter theories, the fastest growth rate occurs at k equals zero, the largest scale in the system. And this is kind of a generic result. You don't determine through a stability analysis what a characteristic length scale is. There's a length scale of crossing where you go from stable to unstable for example. That gives you a length scale, but there's not one that comes from linear stability analysis. Okay, let me just demonstrate this. So if I, if I take a look at a low concentration of extensile swimmers, 
And here they are. I'm looking at how they push around a surrounding die field. This is a three-dimensional simulation. And you can see it's not doing a lot to it. It's just giving a, an effective diffusion to it. It's speeding up its diffusion. On the other hand, if I cross this stability threshold and I go to a high concentration, then I get large-scale motion on the, on the size of the box, large-scale instabilities, and that's what happens to the die field in this case. So it gets very rapidly mixed because it turns out that there's a whole set of kind of, of forming of bands and then these bands fold. So there's kind of a, a folding dynamics in this. It's quite an efficient mixer. If I made a contractile, same concentration, but I just reverse the sign of these local flows, then again, you just get a fast effective diffusion, but nothing that looks like advective mixing. Okay, so con contract, this is already telling you the kind of the microscopics of the actua actuation mechanism are centrally important in the kind of dynamics you get at large scale. And I thought I would just show you this because this is that same movie as before, but it runs a lot longer. I run it faster. So you can just say, oh, Mike, that's turbulence. And we're going to give this to Blakesley and she's going to extract some turbulent statistic out of this, I think, for us. Okay. Okay, so we, we play other kinds of games with this. We take these, we understand a lot about the instabilities now, so we take these types of fluids. We will look at uh, active particles that are, that are made up of little droplets of these active fluids and let them play with each other. We take large ensembles of them. We have our own games that we're playing here quite apart from anything about turbulence or mixing or anything like this, but that's just to show you some of the things we play with. And this is, this is work with uh, David Stein and Yunan Young uh, that are in the group. Now, it turns out, oh, I have, I have about five minutes. So you can adapt this theory to really talk about more sophisticated versions of these motor microtubule systems. And you end up getting a very similar kind of Fokker-Planck description with active stresses, again, that depend on the polarity of the system, how many particles you have pointing this way versus that way that are coupled together by motors. And you have different types of fluxes where now particles move because they're all coupled together by motors. That's how they move. They move relative to a background polarity field, so there's a flux. And so these are, again, the same kind of suspension theory, but now they include liquid crystallinity as an additional stress. They include a, a, a different kind of model for how these guys interact with each other through mean fields and that kind of thing as a derived model under assumptions of diluteness for these types of systems. And you can find uh, lots of things that look a lot like uh, Dojic et al.'s experiments, defect dynamics, production, annihilation of defects, kind of chaotic, turbulent-like mixing, if you like. And Luke is going to talk about this, I think, in other types of models. And one thing that's interesting about this is that if you actually model the fact that in the experiments, that film, or rather that active system, is actually sitting between two fluids, and you model that effect, then you can determine an unstable length scale. You just need one other physical effect, which is the damping that comes from the external environment, and that picks a length scale for you. And so we have a prediction for how that has to look, and that was recently uh, used in interpreting some experiments of active pneumatics. So we're happy about that. Now, that theory, what it does not do, it's nice, it qualitatively produces uh, some of the things seen in the experiment, quantitatively in other cases, but it does not describe this system. And this system is one that's more relevant, we believe, to spindle. And this is where you have a large number of motors uh, in the system per microtubule. Let's see if I can actually get this to. Okay, it's being resistant. But uh, this is a, a new experiment, actually, with Dan Needleman and, and with Zonomir and, and, and work of, of uh, Sebastian from my group. And this is looking at the dynamics in, in highly cross-linked. Basically, you, you have a, a force path through the whole system. So it's a highly cross-linked system, about 25 motors per microtubule. And you're looking by doing... Uh, bleaching of fluorescence, you're looking at how this microtubule sorting is taking place. And the main thing you find 
is that the speed at which microtubules are moving past each other does not depend on their environment, the polarity of their environment, how many people are pointing this way versus that way. The suspension theory does not predict that, just doesn't have the right structure. And so, uh, but that effect is actually something that's seen in real spindles. And what it is telling you is that this is not a dilute system. These are systems that are connected across long length scales. They're not kind of coupled locally. They have long length scale coupling that comes from the density of these motors moving upon them. And uh, we've derived a new theory, actually, where we move the stresses not in the fluid, but in the material. And so now what we do is we have a, a microtubule material that is coupled together by motors, and we ignore the effect of the fluid. And with that, actually, we can uh, explain everything that's going on in those experiments. And that's, that's work with Sebastian, and I'm kind of running out of time. But let me show one more, one more thing, and then I'll stop. Uh, this whole story of extensile dipoles acting on filaments and things like that may actually be relevant to dynamics that's observed inside of the nucleus. And uh, so there have been some recent experiments in the past uh, five, six years uh, that came from Alexander Zadowska when she was a postdoc at, at Harvard in Tim Mitchison's lab, showing that if you looked at the nucleus, the material inside the nucleus in what's called interphase, that there was a considerable amount of dynamics inside the nucleus with bits of the DNA kind of shifting coherently on the scale of microns, which is big, and on the scale of seconds, which is long. And so uh, we came up with a model of this where we thought of the, now it's called chromatin, it's, it's the functional form of DNA inside the cell, where we have extensile dipoles, which are some sort of abstracted model for uh, remodelers of DNA or some sort of enzyme that's acting on DNA that produces an extensile stress. And we were able to get uh, some of the uh, kind of large scale structure on the right length and time scale. So this is actually an active polymer being acted on stochastically by force dipoles. And I think uh, that's a good time for me to stop. Uh, and it could be that William talks about this problem, which I was going to advertise. Yes, please. Thank you. So if you introduce interaction, then there can be synchronization, there can be phase transitions. Are these phenomena observed? And whether so, so there's been a considerable amount of work uh, done on activity-induced phase transitions, which you can see in kind of mean field type models. And this is mostly work coming out of, of Cates' group at, at now Cambridge. So for example, if you have a velocity-dependent swimmer, or you have a swimmer whose velocity depends on density, then you can make a prediction that you will end up having regions of slow swimmers and fast swimmers. Things like that actually also happen in rotor systems. So there are pneumatic phase transitions here? Or? Oh, in, in these systems, there probably, there, there is actually right here on the right. But okay. Yes, there, <laughs> yeah. And that's from work of Kayla, actually, a few years ago. Thanks. Rotor systems, yeah. Especially for the, the systems that have large scale modes, they look a lot like convective systems. I oh. wonder if there's been any uh, connections made between. Yeah, them. That's, that's a good introduction to some of the later talks. So, for, so, first, let me just say that structurally, it has all the things that you want to have in it. It's got convective nonlinearities, that comes from the Fokker Planck equation. It has non local relations, it has quadratic nonlinearities that come from inverting that Stokes equation and shoving it back up into the uh, Fokker Planck equation. So, you know, it's got the right pieces kind of generically. And uh, so there's different ways you can, you can go about that. So you have convictive nonlinearities and nonlocality that you see in classical incompressible turbulence in different structure, in different forms. Yeah. Please. Actually, who, who will address that very directly, I think will be actually all the speakers today. Uh, but uh, also when uh, Dunkel arrives later this afternoon from MIT, he has a kind of a Nave Stokes type description of these of these systems. Yeah. Maybe that makes my question irrelevant, but looking at this, I was thinking that the characteristics of turbulence in fluids has to do with the um, 
transfer of information between a broad self-similar range of scales, large scale forcing <laughs> and small scale dissipation. Yeah. So this, I think that's exactly what Luca will be talking about today. Is that right, Luca? Yeah. So you'll okay. see. Yeah. Well, then I'll wait yeah. and listen to yeah. the talk. Yeah. Good. <laughs> okay. Sure. The uh, your uh, the last bit on the um, on the chromatin and so forth. Yeah. So there you have like a, a poly an active polymer melt. Is that right? So all the momentum transfer is from polymer to polymer, and there's so, no solvent. There's no damping except by. That's right. I see. That's right. So the, so for example, there's no elasticity. There's no elastic right. damping in this system. It's a perfectly jointed chain. Sure. But it's a melt. It's, it's one component. There's no, there's no solvent. Oh, no, right? no. There is a solvent. Oh, there is. Yeah. In fact, so this is a little bit of a peculiar model okay. at the moment because when we talk about an extensile dipole, right. the question is, where are you putting the forces? Mm -hmm. You could do it into the polymer. You could do it into the fluid. Right. You could do a mixture of both. Mm -hmm. To say which one you're going to do, you would need a very specific model of what you think the enzyme is. In this particular case that I is now gone, all the momentum is going into the fluid. I see. And all the polymer is doing is orienting the <clears throat> is providing the geometric backbone that orients the direction of the dipoles, I see. and then it's moved around by it. So, I think you know one of the most interesting things to do in this is to find examples of nuclear motors where you can say very precisely what it's doing. I think I have such an example. Mm. But. <laughs> Please. Sorry, the dipole interaction is standard dipole. One of the cube, or is there any correction due to? No. So, so this is a this is a dipole in Stokes, which means it's a one over r squared interaction. Okay. So, but is there this is a wide question? Is there any analogy to draw with gravity? Well, it, 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 is, it, is a, it is a many body interaction problem in the same sense that you have a Green's function actually that's relating the active particles and they're interacting through a basically a gravitational like term, but has a one over r squared and kind of a tensorial piece that sits in it that you don't see in gravity. It has to do with the orientation of forces. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to hear that comment actually. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Thanks for the invite for the organization. Uh, so I told Mike uh, a few days ago when he asked me to fill up his slot, and uh, I told him I don't work on turbulence, but I work with turbulence. So, um, so here, uh, let me show you thermal convection, okay? So that's a box this size, cubicle. You heat from here, you cool it here, so you drive the system. And uh, here's a flow pattern you visualize with so-called shadow graph. You send the parallel light through this transparent cell, and you see the motion. And the, the, the objective is to look, over the last few decades, the relationship between the nozzle number, which is uh, the heat flux passing through this body, and as a function of the ready, of the control, delta T. Okay, the temperature difference. Here, that's a mixture of uh, water and glycerol. The Rayleigh number is on the order of 10 to the 8, similar to the number for our convective mantle that is uh, underneath of our feet. So I'm going to move, remove this rigid top cooling plate with a free surface here. Okay. So the geometry is a little different, it's elongated, but here I place a plastic plate right in the middle. I hold it by hand. Now what happens is heat will go through this layer of plastic by diffusion, but the heat will escape or due to evaporation from here to here more easily than passing this part. That's the order of 1 to 10. So you have a heat, uh, big contrast in heat loss. So we call this guy, for this reason, we call this guy a thermal blanket. Okay? It reduces locally the heat loss for your system. You, you still keep heating. So the, the flow was visualized by this uh, liquid crystal beads, very small. They could suspend in the fluid for a long time. So they start out from very hot, blue, and then... Uh, when the temperature decays, uh, uh, lowers, 
Uh, you have a green and the yellow and the red and then disappear. It's a beautiful, wonderful uh, material you can use, but they don't suspend too long, and they're kind of pricey. Uh, the question is, okay, once you have this thermal blanket floating in the middle, so you induce a hot upwelling structure, okay, because you, you have a heat accumulating, so here you have effective cooling, the flow goes down like that, you have two competing eddies that each try to drive this one to this side or this side. You have competing force. So if I let go this thermal blanket, you can imagine what will happen. It's, it's an unstable fixed point. It will fall off either this way or the other way. Okay? So take an analogy, that's a sphere or basket, basketball on a landscape like that. You can start with symmetric, but the environment it's noisy because you're dealing with thermal turbulence, so it will fall. Okay, so we call it, of course, the symmetry breaking bifurcation. Okay, so again, this picture is repeated. You lose heat here, but you don't lose heat as much. And then say it falls off this way, and you can see when you move a little away from the axis of symmetry, the force is increasing because this part is subject to the eddy more and more. So you have a force proportional to your displacement. If you integrate this force over space, you get a potential like that, and then you fall off. But don't forget this structure was first induced by this guy, so this potential also follow you at a different time scale. So that gives rise to very interesting dynamics. Okay? So we took the trouble some years ago, we did the experiment at the Rockefeller at some point and then continued at NYU. So that's the fluid domain, and you heat from below, you cool it at the top. That's a free floater. It's a piece of plastic. You can even make an aluminum. The same thing happens, just different time, time scale. Then through this transparent fluid, you send a parallel light, and you see what's going on inside. Let me show you a movie of that. That's a time-lapse uh, recording. You play uh, quickly. I put on a loop. So here, that's a fluid tank. You heat it. You only heat uh, a body of fluid, put a floating plate. You do nothing else. And then you have oscillation. Okay? Here is a little flag. So my, my video camera can, can trace it and get, get to the position nicely. And I've been watching it forever, so it helped me sleep. Right. And here, if you want to see the uh, temperature and flow pattern, again, I put this liquid crystal beads, uh, so you can see the half cycle. What happens is here, and you have this large, I told you these two competing eddies will modify themselves and follow this floater. So here you have a large circulation, and here you have a competing one. So this guy is strong enough, we'll drag this guy to the other position. And then the upwelling, the dividing line between the two eddies, will move slowly to here and to here when this guy is strong enough, and then it brings this guy back. So that's a source of oscillation. And for the sharp eyes here in this audience, you see starry night uh, you know, from Van Gogh. Okay? And uh, I like this photo in particular because you even see motion blur for this guy. So that's nice, right? Okay. Uh, the size is like that. So like a 10 centimeter uh, deep. So the Rayleigh number is on the order 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8. Yeah. So, oops. And here is the time series for the position of this guy. Big L is the size of a tank, horizontal size. Okay? As you change the coverage of your, of your floater, 30% covering the open surface, you have oscillation like that. And then you increase the coverage, and then the oscillation becomes faster and faster because the so-called thermal blanket effect it becomes more pronounced. Right. Yeah. Okay. So this is nice. So in a, in a turbulence regime, uh, no, I made a mistake. That's RA, Rayleigh number, okay? The Rayleigh number 10 to the 8, 
and you have a cyclic, you have coherent state emerging from thermal turbulence. When the larger scale feedback mechanism overrides the fluctuations, the plumes and all that, okay? So uh, Abe you know, commented that this perhaps is the simplest limit cycle you can find in a, in a thermal turbulence. Okay? As we increase the size of this guy, okay, from 50%, 60%, 70%, you see a, a change of state. From oscillations, this guy gets trapped right in the middle. The gray area is accessible area dimension uh, by, by this guy, but it doesn't go to the very edges, but it gets become trapped. We, we really took a lot of time to try to digest what's going on, but in the end, we saw a feedback such like this. When this floater moves to one direction, you see this part opens up, this part shrinks, okay? So th the circulation of this eddy actually is, is related to this guy. When this guy is big, the circulation speed is also increased. It increases when you, the cooling is increased, okay? People don't realize most of the time, uh, always believe the heating drives the, the thermal combustion. It's really both heating and the cooling. So in this case, you increase cooling, you increase the flow speed for this eddy. So if you put this in relationship, the flow speed on one side is positive function of the opening cooling surface. You just put this one in, you get the net force for this plate that, is, that comes down to a, a proportional uh, quantity to the displacement. Here you have a bracket. So what you see here is when the size of the floater is large enough, the whole term here is negative, okay? So you have, you integrate over space. Oh, you integrate uh, over space, you have a potential like that. It's stable. But when this guy is small, so this is uh, negative, this is a negative sign here, it's a positive, you have a potential like that. So here you're bound to have oscillation. Here you have transition from a solitary state to the trapped state. Okay. And that this can be simulated by some either phenomenologic models or direct simulations from Navy Stokes. So you might ask why we went through the trouble of studying this stupid system. The motivation is the Earth, okay? All continents act like thermal blanket, including the one here. We are sitting somewhere here, to be more precise, okay? So each continent is like a 70 kilometers thick. The Rayleigh, Rayleigh number across this uh, a depth of 3,000 kilometers is on the order of 10 to the 7 to the, to the 8. There are journals, papers, and books about these numbers. A lot of people studying these numbers. Okay. And of course, the speed is extremely low. It caps around like a few centimeters per year. So that's a very slow process, but still turbulence. Over the time of this turnover time, okay, you have so much turbulent features, okay. So the question was first, one of the first questions was first asked by Wilson uh, more than 50 years ago. He asked, did Atlantic close and then reopen? And by the, by the end of his uh, article, he concluded the Atlantic was closed and reopened several times over the past a few billion years. This is now called the Wilson cycle. So it's like a 300 million years cycle, okay? Yeah. So in the past, we had, when those continents meet together, we have supercontinent and then break apart. And then in, uh, if you go back in time, you have a different supercontinents by different names, okay? Of course, you ask, ask different schools, they give you different list of names, that's okay. Okay, by that time, you, if you publish in Nature, you can still put a question mark, a hyphen, you know, but now they don't allow this, they don't allow that, okay? <laughs> right. Now when you submit to Nature, you have to use your left hand to pinch your right ear and then press the bottom. That works every time, you can try that. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, 
as we know, for the Earth, we have certain major plates, not just one. Okay, so, so that's again, what we want to study. What about multiple plates, multiple free boundaries in the system? Again, that's a side view of Ready Binar. Okay, so I'm going to put say many plates here individually. Okay, and I hope each every one act like a small thermal blanket. But I could also put this plate at the bottom because thermal convection is symmetric by Bosnes approximation. Okay, so that is good approximation. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I will do in this system many particles here, many plastic beads. They can free freely being entrained by the flow. Okay, and then still act like a teeny tiny thermal blanket. So the movie I'm going to show you is top view. You look down into the cell, okay? I look like this. We track all the individual spheres, the thermal blanket. Okay, you see, you still have this nice uh, cyclic behavior. Okay, that's a density map of the same thing. That's the same data. Okay. So each every one of the, the nylon sphere is like, uh, few millimeter uh, in diameter, uh, but covering about half of the bottom plate in this particular case. So we went through all the you know, relevant Rayleigh number and all that. So this, if you want, this, you can consider this a mobile blanket or mobile continent in some ways. I don't know what happens if I have a elongated uh, aspect ratio, what will happen? For sure, at some point, we won't have these simple oscillations. So to give you a little uh, review, here is a side view from the side, okay? So if you have, uh, uh, that's cooling, that's heating, if you have a large skew circulation, all the spheres will be packed at one corner, okay? But due to thermal blanketing effect, so the heat flux going into here is stronger than here, so this flow structure will be reversed like that, and then your, your, your spheres will be packed here. Okay? Once it's packed here, the flow reverses again. So this feedback loop, a feedforward loop, if you want, will keep going. That's the source of oscillation. Okay. okay. I'm going to change gears to a different problem, also concerning uh, concerns, uh, boundary conditions. So that's a celebrated work by a Swinney's group, uh, uh, published uh, year 2000, okay? So that's uh, the plot over 11 decades. It's just amazing, it's unimaginable, okay? From 10 to the 16 to 10 to the 17, somewhere here, I covered it. So the nozzle number, that's the heat flux going through this system, as a function of Rayleigh, okay? You see a, a nice straight line here, more or less, and uh, the power is uh, to the Rayleigh point 0.3. So we want to look how much heat flux passes through this. Okay? But this plot also tells you that once given a Rayleigh number, and uh, your nozzle is fixed here. Okay? You cannot go here. You probably you can go here by blocking something, but going here is impossible. We try to break from this, this line of power law relationship. So we had an experiment like that in a, in a cell like this size. <coughs> we put partitions in the thermal convection. Still you heat it below and you cool it at the top. And for the convenience of uh, you know, taking fluid out, taking fluid in, and we left a, a lower gap and an upper gap here, okay? That was the source of all troubles, okay? Which is just someone was lazy, you know, wanted to leave a gap here. Okay, so what do we want to do here? The next I want to discuss by plugging in these vertical partitions. How does the heat flux change compared to an empty tank? Okay, yeah. So we could also simulate the process by direct numerical simulation. Okay, I find a different scheme. But uh, make sure with that we keep non slip boundary conditions on all solid walls because they are not moving in this case. Nothing, no boundaries moving. 
the temperature is uh, held, you know, fixed relative number. The fluid uh, uh, satisfies mass conservation, energy conservation. Okay? So I want to emphasize here, I'm doing two terrible things in this system. One is I'm putting these big partitions, removing the fluid. The fluid is the heat transport agent. I remove them, I'm doing, things, doing something terrible for heat transport. Another thing is I'm implementing this non-slip boundary for all solid surfaces that slow down your fluid. That's also bad. But with these two bad factors in, let's see the result. Okay? It turns out the actual heat flux as a number of partitions divided by the, the heat flux without any partition, it grows over n with your number of partitions. Okay? That's the aspect ratio. Uh, five. You can put many. That's, that's a simulation result. Of course, this was inspired by the experiment we did concurrently at that time. Okay? That's the experimental data. Once we put in something there, partitions, we get that. So what's the problem? Why is it we have a huge uh, uh, increase of, of uh, heat flux? Two. And the latest, like a three something, 300%, okay? Considering how much uh, fluid we have removed, I have two, two minutes? Uh, One? You have a minute and 30 seconds. Good, okay. <laughs> Let me show you, okay. A partial, that's, that's a partition, partition, that's a fluid. Let's see what happens, that's a simulation. That tells you the secret. In thermal turbulence, Rayleigh number 10 to the 8, you see each subcell it is dedicated to one direction of flow. Going up, going down, going up, going down. The pressure is high here because the buoyancy is pushing up. And here, pressure is high here because it's going down, pushing. And you have flow, return flow scoops the most heated boundary layer before that area was a forbidden zone. And here on the top also, the coldest fluid is swept by this horizontal jet before you couldn't have any access to this area. But thanks to these big partitions, you have this. I'm finishing. Um, so that's a beautiful lattice for the whole system with uh, uh, velocity and temperature showing. I did ask my collaborators, Give me the worst lattice. That's the worst, OK? And uh, this is really typical, but uh, you know, the good lattice. And here, again, that's my collaborators. Thank you for the time. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I, maybe uh, is it you, you you kill the turbulence. Yes. It becomes a, like a convection. Right. Advection, whatever you call it. For that case. Carry heat. That's why it's so efficient. That's you are trying to say, right? No. Yeah, but having... that's that's one effect. The other effect is really uh, you have access suddenly to the thermal boundary layers, where you have the fluid at extreme temperatures, the coldest and the hottest. You can bring them to the bulk. Before that, you just couldn't easily do this. Oh, the boundary layer has been removed? Yes. Okay. Not removed, just washed yeah. by the return washed flow. Okay. Yes. Right. Thank you. Right. Yes. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, in the last bit, did you, I missed something. Did you choose the period of the, the cell yes, columns? Yes, uh, it's, it's put by hand, no, the partitions. To, be, to agree with the roll period, or? Uh, the patterns is a spontaneous formed. I know, but I mean, I, yeah. independent of what, what spacing you chose? Right. I see. And do you ever get defects where two columns to get, carry flow up and there's sort of a, in the worst? Yeah, for example, yeah. you see this oh, one is okay, down. Okay. Yeah, you have some dead, dead cells. Yeah. Sorry, I just didn't this is really the worst of the worst. Right, right. Yeah. 
you, you know, when we publish things, we always call something typical, but we really choose the best, right? Yeah. But this is really the typical, it happened to be the good one. Thank you. Yeah. As you see, this is not about turbulence. It's about actually a lot of different things which happen in <coughs> the real world at the molecular level. And where all the important chemistry is done and what makes, at the end, you will see what makes life itself possible. So let's go through it. Self-organized networks. This is an old theme. Uh, it's been around for a long time, and uh, theoretical physicists have been interested in it for a long time, but they haven't really been able to see that it's all around them. It's in the, all the experiments they're doing. They just don't see it because it's hidden. Okay, this is, we're going to start out with the place where uh, it showed up and uh, first, in a sense, in the experiments, and puzzled everybody. Lots of Nobel Prize winners uh, had problems, and so on and so forth. Uh, finally, I had a little theory about 30 years ago. The theory seems to have taken hold, so I'm gratified by that. Uh, the, why did it take so long? Well, we'll come to that. Self-organized networks. What is a self-organized network? Well, you have them in glass, for instance, commercial glasses. and. Uh, you all have these little gadgets that you like to consult. Uh, they have a cover made of Gorilla Glass. Some of you have heard of Gorilla Glass, and some of you haven't. But it's a very special glass. And without that special glass cover, your gadget doesn't work. So it was invented uh, to uh, make your gadgets, of course. And it's made a lot of money for a lot of people, especially. Well, we won't go into that. Uh, anyway. Uh, as I say, the really exciting news, we now have been able to apply this to proteins at the molecular level and prove that Darwinian evolution actually occurs. Now, you may have thought that this is something that everybody already knew about. Well, everybody, all the biologists since Darwin, have admitted that Darwinian evolution, selective evolution, occurs. But at the molecular level, there have been some major problems. In fact, uh, as it says here, their methods are oversimplified and they can't prove Darwinian evolution. So they're now writing papers that say it doesn't happen. If I can't prove it, it doesn't happen. Well, we won't go into that. Okay. Now, we're coming to the phase transitions and criticality at phase transitions, and everybody knows all about this. You learned about it, and maybe you've forgotten it, the Van der Waals equation. Beautiful equation more than 100 years old, nearly 150, I guess. Uh, and very, when I studied this in high school, I thought, gee, this applies only to uh, molecular gases. Actually, it applies to just about everything. I was just too young then to appreciate that. So then, when we get to the 20th century, we get to Landau, and he expanded the thermodynamic functions around the critical point in integral powers. That was simple. It leads to a lot of nice little relations. Uh, then Anzager and Wilson studied toy models and found that the powers are not integral. They're fractals. Now, the fractals are system-specific. So if you know the fractals, basically, you know an awful lot. But the question is, how do you know the fractals? That was the stumbling point until they were discovered in 2007 in proteins. This is the first known example of fractals at phase transitions. And the interesting thing is the fractals that describe the phase transitions in proteins are universal. They apply to all proteins. That's why proteins interact so well together and why we're alive. OK, uh, so this is a, a uh, you know, if you're, you're interested in testifying before Congress, it's very cagey. When they ask you, do you believe in evolution, you say, I believe in intelligent design. You don't say whose intelligence. You just say intelligent design, and Congress will approve your appointment. <laughs> That's what actually happened to Francis Collins. OK. So now we're going through these high points in some detail. Now, uh, 
as it says here, uh, we're not too surprised. It, it was a big surprise when the phenomenon was discovered, but after that it was, should not have been surprising that they occur in materials with layered structures, because this is a general aspect of statistical mechanics. You can get weird behavior in lower dimensionality. And uh, it turns out that it's more than two-dimensional. It's actually one-dimensional in the sense that it occurs by percolation, and it is uh, a self-organized percolative network. And you would say, why would that happen? You can't see those impurities in there. They've self-organized them. Well, it would happen because there are very strong internal fields, electric fields in the material, and at lower temperatures, those impurities move around to form the filaments. They are self-organized, right? Self-organized. That's a key word. And uh, so as it says there. And, and that was my 1989 paper. And people are now, I'm gratified to say, only 30 years later, publishing a lot of papers saying, you know, Phillips was right. Uh, I won't say what all the Nobel Prize winners said in between, but it's really not worth talking about. Now we go to Gorilla Glass. Okay. Next, uh, the story on Gorilla Glass, uh, Corning was doing fine back in the uh, dot-com days, making optical fibers for the internet, but then the dot-com bust came along, and it was bad news. The stock went up first when they were making the fibers from 10 to 100, and then when they didn't need fibers anymore, they don't burn out. Uh, uh, went from 100 to 3, and the company was going out of business. So how did they recover? They invented Gorilla Glass. And for those of you that know a little chemistry, uh, you recognize aluminosilicate is a little different from borosilicate, and just enough to make all these remarkable properties possible. Uh, so uh, it turned out that we'd been working on uh, self-organized networks in glass. And although the first version of Gorilla Glass was entirely their invention, uh, all the subsequent versions were refined using the theory of self-organized networks that we'd been working on. And along the way, an important feature in these glasses is quenched in stress. So uh, when you cool the glass, of course, there will be built-in stress in the, in the system. And you can then try to measure the stress relaxation. And it turns out this is an old problem, uh, about 150 years old. In fact, when we found this number three-sevenths and actually gave a derivation of it, uh, it was, we solved a problem that was 150 years old. And I believe it was the oldest unsolved problem in science. Uh, nobody's challenged that because, you know, going back 150 years, nearly everything's been done, but this held out for a long time. And it's unusual. You know, most of the pure numbers that you see physicists talking about involve spins. There's some spin that shows up and so on. Uh, this does not involve quantum mechanics of spins at all. It's just the nature of the stress relaxation in a self-organized network. You have to be very close to a homogeneous system. None of these turbulent fluctuations that we've been talking about. The glass has to be very homogeneous. If it's very homogeneous, the last stage of relaxation is the one where this three-sevenths pops up. And that, of course, keeping it homogeneous and making high quality, Corning's made a lot of money from that. OK, so uh, now when you're doing these things, you're, you're saying, gee, this sounds a lot like the stuff is alive. I mean, it's nearly perfect. It's almost it's self-organized and so on. Is it really? Well, yes. Proteins are the ultimate self-organized networks. So what does a protein chain consist of? It has uh, peptide segments, a little thing, decorated with amino acid side groups, and each assigned a letter. Then when I show you the protein's amino acid sequence, it looks like an encoded message. It may have 300 letters. It may have 1,000 letters. But they go along, you look at them, and they say, what does that mean? So you can't figure out what that means. So you go over to people who do crystal structures, and you look at the three-dimensional structures of proteins. Uh, and that's fine, except that they're not alive. 
the three-dimensional structures are in the ground state, and a functioning protein, of course, has to go from the resting state to the excited state, and then it has to go back. And if you think about the huge number of degrees of freedom involved, the fact that it can start out at the resting state, go to the functional state, and then reversibly return to the ground state is quite remarkable. It's absolutely necessary for life. So you are very close to thermodynamic equilibrium. Uh, some comments here about molecular. There are limitations. You try to apply Newtonian methods, as Martin Karplus is most famous for doing, to uh, protein motion. And uh, there are some technical problems. Uh, for the mathematicians and the physicists, you re remember that Newton had something called the central field approximation for the motion of the planets. We don't have the central field approximation here, and we have a giant computer which we hope will do the job. It does the job quite well uh, for nanoseconds, and sometimes for microseconds, but the protein functioning times are milliseconds, and that's a problem. Well, if we use self-organization, we can get around all these problems, and that is sort of what we've been building up to. How do proteins fold into globules? So they start out with this chain, it's it put it into water, it collapses into a globule. Uh, so we're going to analyze the uh, amino acid sequence and connect it to the folded globular three-dimensional structure. How can we do that? Well, I wouldn't have done it, but somebody else did it. Uh, First of all, there's a little remark here. You really have to distinguish between first and second order phase transitions. And for that, you need two different scales. So we're realistic about that. We admit proteins have both first and second order effects in their thermodynamics. So we have two scales. The first scale comes from 1982. This one in made by the biologists was easy. They simply measured the change of, of the enthalpy from taking the amino acid from water to air. That's a first order translation for sure. So, what do we do with the second order effects? I thought that was an impossible problem, but I also thought maybe, you know, the database keeps growing, people keep trying new things, somebody will hit it. So, they, uh, so I kept looking for it. I started looking in 2002, basically because Corning had taken over all my work on network glasses, and I, they didn't need me anymore. They were doing what I'd been doing much better anyway. So uh, I switched to start looking for this, and fortunately, these guys, at the same time I was started to look for it, they found it. Two Brazilian uh, st statistical mechanics types in Santana, which you've probably never heard of, uh, and uh, they were able to find this universal property of the solvent accessible surface area associated with each amino acid in a long protein chain. The chains fold back on themselves, and there it is. The log of the solvent accessible surface area is linear in the log of the length of a segment of reasonable length. This is an amazing discovery. And my contribution was I found it. Uh, I also realized it was associated with self-organized criticality, and they did not have the word criticality in their paper. So it made it lost in the literature, except I found it. Anyway, so here it is. Uh, I think this is the most exciting 21st century problem in theoretical science. And it's beyond the reach of biologists, because they just don't have enough mathematics. OK, now I have a couple minutes left. Uh, so this is a thing I'm currently excited about. Uh, Francis Collins did sequence human DNA, and the DNA of many species is known. And from that, you can generate the sequences of all the proteins and so on and so forth. It's a huge database. It's called the genomic database. And can we connect DNA to, to uh, sort of real problems like diseases? Well, that's very, very hard. People are trying to do that. And so far, I've seen 100 software programs, and none of them really do anything, but they show people know how to write software. Uh, OK, is there an easier 
thing than just solving diseases like cancer and so on and so forth. Uh, and there is. What you really want to do is pick an easy practice problem, and the easy practice problem is going to the dogs. Now, those of you who like to read the Tuesday science section of the Times saw a story about dogs about a week ago. And you may actually, if you probably didn't read it. You're not interested in dogs. But uh, uh, a lot of people are. And a lot of people did read it and found it very interesting. Uh, so dog DNA is known for many breeds. And they've been collecting that data for the last 10 years. And uh, so where in their DNA is the information used to construct their neural networks. In other words, can we correlate canine DNA to intelligence variations from breed to breed? And I don't know the answer to that. We're working on that right now. But it's a really fascinating problem. So that's all. Question for James. Yes. You mentioned the dog problem with the, you want to find in the DNA where the intelligence lies. Why not just where the length of the nose lies or something simpler than that? Because intelligence is more interesting. Uh, in fact, in fact, uh, well, for one thing, the length of the nose or something like that is likely to depend on many proteins. And the reason I got into this was I came across just one protein that was described as highly concentrated in the cerebral forefront cortex. In other words, the part of your brain that thinks. And this is the only, I've been working on this subject now for 11 years, and I've seen a lot of proteins. And this was the only one that is specific to the brain. Now, two groups are working on this at present. One is at NIH in Francis Collins' group. The other is a molecular biologist at Princeton. She was the one that was actually mentioned in the New York Times article, which is how I found out about her. You can't keep up with anything these days. Uh, anyway, she has gone what you said, the physiological thing. That was what the NIH uh, researcher did. She connected physiological properties. And she had 16 physiological properties correlated with a lot of stuff. I didn't learn much from that. But the interesting thing is the molecular biologist at Princeton went one step further, and she asked, where did most of the mutations between the different breeds occur? And they occurred in genes, not proteins, we're still at a much higher level, genes, which are known to be connected with the brain. So she moved one step closer than you, and by what you did was what NIH did first. She moved one step closer. She found that most of the breed variations are in brain genes. But she had an awful lot of them. Huge number. And that's a big thing when you get into this, is the huge number. When you try to be specific, you find no matter what qualification you use, either you don't get anything or you get a lot. Now, but in any case, uh, brain is already in the right direction. But I think, <clears throat> if I'm right, that I have a magic key. You notice everything I does, do is based on magic keys, hidden variables, or whatever you want to call it. I spend a lot of time looking for those. Because I figure, why work hard to find something if somewhere in the literature somebody hasn't already found what you're looking for? So I just go around, in effect, uh, looking for great discoveries. I got a lot of them all laid out, and then I connect the dots into a self-organized network, uh, which is, you know, does make a marvelous things. But I do as little at the beginning myself as possible and as much in the literature. That's something I was able to do because I spent my career at Bell Labs and not teaching in a university. I was at Chicago for a while, but when I got a chance to go to Bell Labs and do pure research, that's what I did. There's a similarity between the Flatiron Institute and Bell Labs. People even say Jim Simons is trying to build a copy of Bell Labs in the Flatiron Institute or something like that. Uh, the similarity is that if you're at the Flatiron Institute or Bell Labs, you can work on anything. You don't have to work on what everybody else is working on. You don't have to worry about getting uh, you know, funding. You don't have to worry about teaching a course. 
you can do anything you want. And uh, on my last remark, Arno Penzias, uh, you remember him, he was the guy who found the three degree Kelvin background radiation, the Big Bang and all that stuff. Well, as a sort of a punishment for making that discovery, he was made president of Bell Labs. <coughs> and uh, he used to give an annual talk. And in his annual talk, uh, he didn't say much, but I remember one thing he said that I really struck me. He said, if you're at Bell Labs and you're doing the kind of research that you could be doing in a university, then you're not taking advantage of your situation. And I thought that was exactly right. If, if you know, A lot of people at Bell Labs, especially the experiments, what they loved to do was find something that people were doing in a university, find a new piece of equipment, which cost a lot of money, which we could afford to buy, and they couldn't. So they bought the shiny new piece of equipment and did what the academics were doing only better. Uh, uh, what Arno was trying to say is you can do better than that, or you should take advantage of your situation and try to do better than that. Okay. Let's thank James again.